Welcome to this presentation. It is intended mostly for new Christians, but it should also be beneficial for those that are further along in their Christian walk. Let's start at the beginning. You've been saved. Maybe it was a big ordeal where God dramatically entered your life and changed your heart. Or maybe it was a more subtle event and a slow process of growing is occurring in your heart. But in any case, you have repented of your sins and you've asked Jesus to be your Lord. Can you be sure that you are saved? Many times there's no doubt in our minds about this and there's a strong sense of joy and peace associated with having been saved. And as many Christians say, you know that you know. But if you are unsure, the Bible is very clear on how to tell for sure. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. Basically, you will start to see that you are changing for the good in your life. For some people, usually those that were living very badly, they see a huge dramatic change very quickly the moment Christ comes into their heart. But for others who may not have been living in an obviously sinful way, or for people that grew up going to church and sort of put on a show of godliness for much of their life, their change will be less dramatic, but it will still be very noticeable over time because they will now want to refrain to do the things that previously they were only pretending not to want to do. And many other wonderful changes like this occur on the inside, in your heart. So much of the Bible is understood better when you understand this one thing. The theological term for it is called regeneration, and basically it means that once you are saved, you will start to be changed by God through His power, and you will notice that you are changing and you'll begin to feel bad when you do sinful things. And that new feeling is a different kind of bad. It's not the kind of feeling bad about sins that the devil wants you to feel, like guilt. It's different. The Bible calls it conviction. And what happens is that you start to be convicted of your sins to such a degree that you no longer will want to do them anymore. It may start out with the really big, obvious sins in your life. And once those are taken care of, you will find other things that need to be worked on. And this is actually a joyful thing, because the less sin that you have, the less God's power will be hindered in your life. Does this mean that we will never sin again? No, it doesn't. But because of Christ, sin no longer has a badge of authority over you. Its power is broken, and if you resist it, you will begin to win more and more victories in your life over sin, and you will be blessed for it. Here are some Bible verses that talk about this new change in our lives. In Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, it says, A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will take out of your flesh the heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to observe my ordinances. In Philippians it says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. In Galatians it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In the book of John, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If any man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me you can do nothing. Also in the book of John, Jesus says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. In the book of Acts it says, To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And all of this is because of the Holy Spirit that we are given. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God dwelled in the temple of the Holy of Holies, a special room in the temple. It was a big deal. Only the high priest could enter into that part of the temple where God's Holy Spirit was, and even he could only do it once a year to make atonement for the sins of the people of Israel. But here's the part that I want you to notice. The high priest had to have his own sins very carefully atoned for before he could even go in. Because if it wasn't done properly, he would have died 
standing in contrast to God's holiness. They even tied a rope around his ankle in case he did die while he was in there so that they could pull him out without having to go in there themselves. Now consider this verse from the New Testament. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have received from God? This means that God himself has found a way to dwell in our bodies even though we are sinners. This is what God was trying to do. He was trying to reconcile the world to himself. He made a way to be able to forgive our sins and yet still judge all sin. God's holy and justified wrath against our sins and the sins of the whole world was paid in full. His wrath was satisfied. It was poured out on Christ at the cross. And so now if we believe in Christ, our debt is paid. God can view us as righteous under his own law. And so he can dwell in us and give us his power to overcome sin and to live victoriously. The book of 2 Corinthians says it this way, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. The Holy Spirit is like a knob, not a switch, and if you are saved, you are automatically not on zero. The Spirit's filling is a matter of degree. Romans 8 verse 9 says, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. There is a sense in which all true Christians whatever their spiritual condition, are influenced to some degree by the Holy Spirit, since they are indwelt by Him. The question then is one of degree. To what degree is the Spirit filling or controlling you? It's the key to everything. A great prayer to pray for is for God to give you a greater measure of His Spirit, or that it may dwell more perfectly within your life. Because the more of Him that you have, the more you start to see things like Him, and the more power in prayer you will have, and the more of Him equals more conviction, which equals more righteousness. Sometimes God's dwelling more perfectly within you is being hindered by sin, sin that you may still be hanging on to, even though you have now been given the ability to turn from it. This was the case with me. I had many physical and mental addictions just after becoming a Christian. And what I found is that I had an increasing holy and good conviction that these things were wrong and that they were hindering my walk with God and leaving me vulnerable to all kinds of spiritual attack. I found no matter what the sin or how strongly you think it has you, it can be broken if you are in Christ. But it does require you to repent. Biblical repentance basically means a change of mind and heart to turn away from sin and to turn to God. You have to make a conscious choice to refrain from the sin and eventually something amazing will happen. James 4 verse 7 will kick in. It says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil will flee from you if you stick to resisting him. It may be tough at first, but God will show you that his word is true. Often people pray and pray for God to take certain desires from them, and he will, but you have to hold up to your end of the bargain too. Repent and turn from the sin. Again, this does not mean that you won't ever sin again, but that the instances of sin will become further and further apart and less and less severe. And if you do commit a major-ish sin, you will feel so convicted about it that you will repent immediately and be cleansed. One thing that you might want to do as a new Christian, and which is a good principle to live by, is to repent of any old bottled up unforgiveness that you may have for either God or for someone that has wronged you in the past. Unforgiveness and anger is like poison, and you will be so refreshed to see the effect of forgiveness of those that have wronged you. It's like a chemical reaction. The biblical reason that anger and unforgiveness is so poisonous is found in Ephesians 4 verse 26 where it says, 
Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. The word place there is the Greek word topos. Sometimes it's translated as the word foothold. Basically, anger is a way that Satan can get more traction in influencing your life. And if your anger gives him a foothold, guess what he's going to want to do with that foothold? Use it to get you more angry, because in that way he gets an even bigger foothold and more and more power in your life. And it becomes a vicious cycle that needs to be broken by the power of forgiveness. I've known a Christian brother who was so full of unforgiveness over some abuse in his early life that he was experiencing some major spiritual warfare because of it. It says in Matthew 18 verse 23 through 35, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But forasmuch as he had not to pay, his lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But that same servant went out, and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison, till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what they had done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their lord all that was done. Then his lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wickedest servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredest me. Shouldest thou now also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Hebrews 12 verse 15 says, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Notice that the end says, many be defiled. This is very common, if not one of the most common everyday things that defile people. Many bondages can be shed when a person forgives those who have wronged him or her. The thing is, is that sometimes it's very hard to forgive people, because they did something to deserve it most of the time. But, brothers and sisters, this is not important. The only reason that any person does any sin is because they have been deceived in one way or another themselves. And even if they had not, it is not for us to judge these things. Our job is to love them anyway. The Bible says it this way, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And he also gave us this commandment, But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I suggest that we should look at anger as a bad thing, and that we should seek to repent at the very first sign of it coming up again. Even though the person may deserve our anger, it is inconsequential. It is for our own good that we do not carry around that burden of unforgiveness. If you're asking yourself the question, well, how do I do all these things? The answer to this is the same as the answer to almost every single problem a Christian has. To pray and to read the Bible. Prayer is one of our greatest gifts from God. Remember, we are now reconciled to God, and this is one of the best benefits of being reconciled to God, to be able to call upon the Lord as if He were our own Father, to approach the throne of the King of everything, and to ask our requests. Romans 5 verse 10 says it this way, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, being reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. You should never feel as if you shouldn't pray or that you have sinned too much and should hide from God. This is a lie from the enemy. You can always pray. If you stumble, run back to Jesus, and he is faithful to forgive and to strengthen you. Colossians 4 verse 2 says, Devote yourselves to prayer, 
being watchful and thankful. You should talk to God always and ask Him for the things that you need, and not just assume that He knows. Of course, He does know, but He wants us to ask. The reason is, is because when He answers your prayer, it will begin to build in you a very valuable thing, which is faith. Faith, in the Bible, is not, as some say, believing despite the evidence. That's foolishness. Faith in the Bible is more like trust. In my experience, after so many times of seeing God answer my prayers in such a way that demonstrated to me that not only was He listening to me, but I could tell in the way that He answered those prayers that He loved me and wanted what was best for me. This over time built faith, like the kind of faith that you have in a great friend who has always come through for you in the past. You have faith that they will come through for you again in the future. That's what He wants. He wants you to trust Him. Set aside time to pray. Also, you can make little prayer requests throughout the day. Go through your life with Jesus. It will be a much more exciting life. Another way to build faith is by reading the Bible. Hearing of all the things that God has done for people in the Bible will strengthen your faith, but reading the Bible has much more benefits than that. The Bible is living and active. The book of Hebrews says just that. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Reading it on a regular basis frees us and blesses us. The book of James says this, But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. It will also show us how to navigate through this life successfully. It's like an owner's manual for your soul. Matthew 7 verse 24 and 25 says, Therefore, whoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And Psalm 119 verse 9 says, How can a young man keep his ways pure? By living according to your word. So does this mean that we won't ever go through hard times ever again? Of course not. You will. You'll go through hard times. But the important thing to remember is that sometimes God won't yank you out of the hard times. He wants to go through the hard times with you. This is because we as Christians are going to live for eternity, and we're going to have an existence that will extend far beyond this world. And there are many things that God wants to teach us, and sometimes the only way that we can learn them is through adversity. When adversity comes, there are two choices that you can make. One is to blame God, or to have a mini rejection of God on some level. This is the road that Satan will try his hardest to get you to take. He wins a victory if you curse God. Like in the book of Job, Job had all kinds of horrible things happen to him. Satan was sure that it would have caused Job to curse God. But Job eventually resolved to say of God, Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. And that is the other choice that you can make. To trust God. Hard times should be a reminder to pray, to go through the hard times with God, to learn the lessons that he wants you to learn. He wants to build this relationship with you. You will find that it is in those times of adversity that God is nearer to you than ever before if you're looking for Him. A very important part of your Christian walk will be an awakening to the reality of spiritual warfare. The Bible said it clearly in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, where it says, For we wrestled not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Demons are real. They are actual entities operating on a different dimension. They operate in a hierarchy system, kind of like an army, and their general, so to speak, is Satan himself. They can have different assignments, too. Here are just a few types from the Bible. They're seducing spirits, mute spirits, spirits of infirmity, spirits of divination, spirits of fear, spirits of bondage, lying spirits, familiar spirits, or family spirits. The good news is that they are all absolutely terrified by the authority of Jesus, that they are all bound to do whatever they are told under that name by a Christian. This is because Jesus gave us this authority to use. He put all the demons under the subjection of any Christian, even though most nowadays either don't believe that they have this authority, or worse, they don't believe that demons exist. This is what Jesus said in Luke 10, verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power 
to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather because your names are written in heaven. In other places the Bible says, Then he called his twelve disciples together, and gave them power and authority over all demons, and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. In Luke 9, verse 1. Much of Jesus' ministry was in the casting out of demons of people. So how do people get demons? There are many ways, but mostly they deceive people into giving them their free will. Because it seems that demons require human free will to enter and to affect much of this dimension. So they have devised ways to trick us into giving it to them. Take a Ouija board, for example. It's nothing more than a piece of cardboard and some paint. But what is happening when people sit down to contact spirits is that they are effectually saying, I want spirits to come to this plane, and that is what demons need, not the cardboard. There are other ways, of course. Sometimes demons can travel through generational lines, or sometimes a parent or a grandparent can do rituals that will affect the child. The fact is, is that until we are in Christ, we are vulnerable to all kinds of things. But once you are in Christ, nothing can separate us from the love of God. One of my favorite books in the Bible, the book of Romans, says it this way, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So be bold in your authority through Christ. No, not every bad thing is caused by demons. But be sure that there are afflictions and problems that have a spiritual component. And demons are allowed to tempt and to oppress Christians too. So use your discernment and don't back down if you encounter a situation where the powers of darkness are evident. Because the Bible clearly says in 1 John 4 verse 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. What about baptism? Is it required for salvation? No, it's not required for salvation, but we are clearly instructed to do it if possible. Salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. An often used illustration of this is the thief on the cross. In Luke 23 verses 39 through 43 it says, One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we, indeed, have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. All of us must repent and believe. That's the only way to salvation. This is what the thief was doing on that cross. And Jesus said that he would be with him in paradise that day. And he was not baptized. Baptism is the testimony, if you will, of our willingness to be united in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It is an outward sign to the world that we have been born again into the kingdom of God. But it is not the way to salvation. But we are instructed to be baptized. There's no question about it. In my experience, I eventually developed a strong desire to learn about and to get baptized. I found a small little house church in my town, and they baptized me right there in a local lake. It is my belief that God will do the same for you. That is, prompt your spirit to get baptized. It's a wonderful thing. Every Christian should do it if possible. What about all the prophecies in the Bible about the future, sometimes called the end times or last days? It can all be a bit confusing for a new Christian, and sometimes it seems that there's a lot of division on the issue. But I think that you'll find that most Christians agree on the basics, which is that there will be a time in the future when Satan is going to try to deceive the entire world into worshiping a man sometimes referred to as the Antichrist. It will be so good of a deception that even some very good people will believe that this man is God. Around this time, the wrath of God will be poured out on the earth just before the real Jesus Christ returns and sets everything right again. And after this, there will be a judgment day of all those that have ever lived. The debate is about the timing of the so-called rapture. In the Greek, it's called the harpazo, and it's basically a physical taking of Christians to spare them from some or all of this time of wrath. Some think that it will happen before the Antichrist, some think that it will be right in the middle of all of this, some before the wrath of God but after the tribulation of the so-called six seals, and some right before the real Jesus returns. 
All of that to say that what people disagree about is really pretty insignificant. The timing of the rapture is a relatively small point compared to what we all tend to agree on. It is important not to get overly concerned with the end time stuff before you get grounded in the basics. Sometimes people do this and they stunt their spiritual growth in my opinion. I will now give you some recommendations for material and resources that helped me in my discipleship. I will provide links in the description section of this video. The first and most obvious one is the Bible. People ask which version of the Bible to get. I personally like the King James version of the Bible for lots of reasons. I also recommend that you get it on MP3 if possible. It's a great way to listen to the Bible when you're doing other tasks like washing the dishes and such. Some of my favorite books to start off with in the Bible are the books of Romans, the book of John, the book of Ephesians, and I recommend starting with the New Testament before going to the Old Testament because you will get so much more out of the Old Testament that way. But I love the book of Proverbs and the book of Psalms from the Old Testament no matter where you are. I personally have gained much of what I know through the listening of commentaries and Bible studies on my MP3 player. And if you have one, I recommend downloading all kinds of material. Here are some of my favorite individuals. They make the Bible come alive and help you to see how interesting it is. David Guzik. David Guzik is one of my new favorite teachers. He has such a gift for teaching. He has material on almost all the books of the Bible, both written down and in audio form. And it's all free, and you can get it at his archives on his website, EnduringWord.com. I also highly recommend David Guzik's audio series on the history of the church. It is such an eye-opener to understand this proud legacy of true believers in Christ that we are all a part of. You can download that at his website, too. The next on my list is Chuck Missler. Mr. Missler is a brilliant teacher of the Bible, and he will help you understand the depths of the Bible. He has a lot of audio files online, too, including free streaming audio from almost every book in the Bible available at firefighters.org, which is a great resource for free sermons. Missler also has much of his material for sale at his website, khouse.org. The next is Russ Dizdar. Russ played a huge part in my discipleship. He is a very productive teacher and has provided hundreds of hours of free material on his website, shatterthedarkness.net. If you ever choose to support his ministry, Russ also has a huge list of audio courses on various subjects that have helped me tremendously. Finally, as I mentioned before, I think worship music is important. I think that by listening to music, we can worship God in a way that is not possible without it. I am a musician, and I can be a little picky, but I thought I would share some of my favorite Christian artists and worship bands with you. The first is a band called Hillsong. The next, Ryan Delmore. Barry and Terry Collicutt. Bob Dylan's album Saved. And Chris Lazat. If you have any questions, you can go to our website, dvdtracked.com. That's dvdtract.com. Or email us at thegospeldvd.com at yahoo.com. Thanks for your time.